Magandang araw mga kababayan. Welcome to TVUP, TV Ops Science Innovation Series. I'm Giselle Concepcion, a professor at the Marine Science Institute of UP Diliman, and I do research on marine drug discovery and development. I'm your host for today. Our topic is one of the hottest topics in the country today, and it's a dirty topic. It's on responsible, sustainable mining. We are happy to have with us two resource persons from UP Diliman. The uh, director of the National Institute of Geological Sciences, Dr. Mario Aurelio. Welcome, Mario. And Dr. Perry Ong, professor of biology in the Institute of Biology. Thanks for coming, Perry. We know that uh, this is a controversial topic in our country today. And so we would like to hear it first from our NIGS director. Mario, what's the business as usual mode of mining in our country today? Okay, um, to put things in perspective, uh, that question should be answered, I guess. Uh, taking into account what has recently just happened uh, as far as the regulatory body is concerned, meaning the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, uh, a department of uh, a cabinet uh, department of the government, which uh, recently had a um, drastic change, I would say, in its uh, leadership because the former uh, Secretary-designate uh, Gina Lopez was replaced by a new secretary now, uh, General uh, Simatu. So on the basis of that, the, well, dur because during the time of um, secre Secretary-designate Gina Lopez, ex-Secretary-designate Gina Lopez, uh, she instituted a lot of changes, including, for example, the suspension of mining permits. Uh, at least about 70, 75 mining permits were suspended. Until now, those mining permits are still in suspension because that suspension has not been, um, has not been legally uh, changed yet. So in other words, uh, the status at the moment is that those suspensions exist. So it's still a sort of a status quo Although the industry is a bit more up mode now because upbeat because of the expectations that uh, soon enough these um, suspensions will eventually be reverted back into uh, non suspensions and therefore the mining industry can proceed which is, uh, with, with its uh, usual business. But having said that, however, uh, there's now a difficulty as far as the government is concerned to do just the reversion of these suspensions because it has to go through a process again, uh, which will take a little time. So I would say it's a little bit more hopeful than in the previous year, at least. So Mario, what was the basis for uh, the suspension of the 75 out of the more than 200 mining companies. What were the uh, criteria that were um, evaluated? Well, uh, the suspensions came after a what was then called as a mining audit. And the mining audit was conducted by the Mines and Geosciences Bureau, of course, together with the Environmental Management Bureau. These are two bureaus of the Department of Environment and Natural resources and it was a countrywide mining audit, um, highly technical uh, and after the results of the mining audit then the secretary decided to, um, well, made her decision to, to issue the suspensions. As to the basis of the suspensions, it's very technical. There's a list, some sort of a checklist for the mining auditors that they, they uh, verify in the field so uh, technical personnel were sent out to the field to check on all the highly technical issues, including, for example, environmental issues, environmental compliance, 
uh, because we have to remember that uh, mining operations, uh, according to the Mining Act of uh, 1995, RA 17942, uh, has really very strict regulations, uh, including environmental regulations. And if you violate any of those uh, regulations, then uh, it could be a justification for your suspensions. I would say it's essentially non-compliance or violation of some of the several of the regulations in the Mining Act, but foremost among them would be the environmental issues. So I've always been curious, Mario, uh, what the uh, basis for, say, violation would be. Do we as a, an academic institution, NAGS in particular, um, help the DNR in monitoring, say, chemical pollutants in the soil, in the water, in the air, in the... Yes, uh, from time to time, uh, there have been instances in the past, until now, that um, not only UP, other institutions as well, are consulted by the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. In fact, they even grant projects, they fund projects, to um, basically address some issues that uh, the DNR thinks is not capable of doing as far as the technicalities are concerned. Uh, but in theory, actually, the DNR has capability because it has the MGB, the Mines and Geosciences Bureau, and the Environmental Management Bureau. These are the two arms of the DNR for such concerns. But as I said, yes, uh, there are instances where um, from time to time, DNR would consult uh, academic institutions, UP included, um, to um, take a look at uh, such problems. I can cite several where NIGS have been, has been involved, like for example, the pollution along uh, Buwak River after the disaster in the Marinduque mining, um, uh, dam failure. Uh, some of our faculty members at UP were uh, given a um, small grant uh, to study precisely what happened to the river in Boa. So, um, my own um, thinking as a chemist is that um, if uh, someone were to do an audit, it would be based on the scientific data. And so, I wondered when the 75 were suspended, whether there was chemical analytical data uh, as basis for saying you are causing pollution and therefore you have to be suspended because I know that's how it's done in other countries. And the uh, monitoring of the pollutants is continuous. It's periodic, it's uh, regular, okay? It's not just a one-time uh, monitoring, okay? So I'm happy to know that NIGS, other UP units and other academic institutions have been asked by the DNR to help in the environmental monitoring. But we know very well that uh, it's not only the um, physical or geological environment that is affected by mining. We say there is the, um, uh, the uh, biostrata, in particular the biodiversity, and of course the human population that's affected by mining activities. So, Perry, can you tell us a bit more about your own findings about the impact of mining on our uh, biodiversity? Yes, uh, but uh, to answer that, I'd like to preface it with uh, this statement. Anna. First of all, mining in itself brings societal goods. Yeah. So there's no argument it brings societal goods. So the question is whether it's not whether we do mining or not. No? If, if uh, we want to maintain and continue the, the way human society uh, lives now, then mining has, will continue. No? Even under the law, as uh, Dr. Aurelio mentioned, there's a, it's legal. It's legal to do mining in the country. The question is, so the, the question now is what's, what's the problem with mining? So as you mentioned, there are impacts on the human environment, there's impact on the ecosystem, on biodiversity. So those are the things that, are, uh, that need to be addressed. Okay? Uh, and uh, in this context, I, I'd like to, the, 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 the context I'd like to bring in is that even the president have made a pronouncement that he is not against mining. But 
he is against the continuing practice the way mining is practiced in the country. Mm. So having said that, it means that the business as usual model of mining cannot proceed. Mm. Okay, it has mm -hmm. to uh, it has to uh, be undertaken now in in the new context of awareness about the impacts. How how do you now do mining, giving uh, considerations to the human community, human welfare, and, and environment? Okay. Mm. So uh, again, to reiterate, we, we need to have a new mode of uh, uh, operations you know, for mining to consider biodiversity and human welfare into their equation. Now, the problem is, uh, I think that one of the major problems is that mining companies look at taking these cons considerations into the equation will mean reduced profit. And, and that's where the, uh, I think the the issue, you know, the conflict would arise. Because most corporations being corporations, they have stock dividends, they, they, have, they have to have profit. And they're, they're used to get, to earn mega profit. And uh, if they change their operation, it might reduce their profit. And that's what, that's uh, usually the reason why they are hesitant to include uh, uh, these two considerations into the equation of their operation. But if, if they're willing, it, it, again, if, if, they, if they remember that mining is not being banned, but rather mining needs to be operated under new, new conditions, then as long as they're willing to reduce even a bit of their profit, I think it can be done. Yeah. So, Barry, what would you suggest uh, we uh, propose uh, as uh, academics to improve the uh, policy and then the implementing rules and regulations for um, the mining industry that would take into consideration uh, these uh, biodiversity, environment, and uh, human health, and socioeconomic improvement issues that have been raised, you know, in, with the mining industry. So. Maybe you can tell us, you know, there are there are areas where we should not allow mining at all. Are there areas where uh, this this is to be encouraged? Are there new areas to explore? Mm -hmm. I think uh, I've, I've been in discussion with many groups about how to improve the operations of mining, and uh, first of all, uh, there's this mindset that. Mining rehabilitation happens only after the closure of a mine. Mm -hmm. I think the first mindset should mm -hmm. be that that should be changed is that mining rehabilitation should start on day one. Continuous. For example, uh, in terms of heavy equipment, in mining operations, the main, main equipment at the start would be a bulldozer. Mm -hmm. they, they would bulldoze uh, trees and all the topsoil, etc., so that they can get to the mine. The mindset we need to change is instead of a bulldozer, we propose to use a backhoe. Mm. Meaning a backhoe will now lift the soil and place it somewhere instead of just pushing it off the, the, the ridge. Okay? So it means that topsoil that the backhoe will collect will be the source of material to rehabilitate that area that had been mined out. So, so in terms of heavy equipment, that will be used. It's just a change from a bulldozer to a backhoe. I have to ask Mario if you think this is feasible. Um, well, I do not completely agree because um, different materials have their own properties yes. and therefore the mechanisms or the methodologies that you have to employ will also differ. Of course, economics come in. Uh, the reason why bulldozers are used is they are cheaper, basically. But then again, as Perry said, uh, there's a better way, more environmentally friendly way, but it will be more expensive. And again, that goes into the economics of mining, and that was mentioned by Perry, which uh, eats up into their budget and therefore lessens their profit. But then if, if they do it, it will reduce their problem with the public. So instead of spending PR money to clean their image, why don't, why don't mining companies use it at the front end? instead of using it to clean up their image. So, in the, so what I'm asking the mining company to do is look at the big picture. 
Because if they continue doing what they do, they're going to be stuck. If they want to continue, then they have to change the ways they do business. Of course, uh, I think that the first thing I'd like to, to, to reiterate is the mindset itself. The details we can work on later. But we have to agree first that we have to change the way we do business. Because continuing the way mining does it business is not sustainable. It's going to end badly. So my, my suggestion is rethink how we do business. It, as I've said, it will eat up. But again, you spend money at the end to clean up your image, to make you look good. Why don't you do the right thing right at the very beginning, not at the end? It's also a matter of scales, actually. The very simple example of Perry uh, about uh, replacing a bulldozer with a backhoe, that can take place in a room like this. But if you're dealing with a um, larger area, a mountain, then that same concept, use a bulldozer, but then you'll have to recover the same material that you pushed with something else, like trucks. And that's what they are doing in some areas. They uh, push some some dirt or some soil, but then they, they recover and put it somewhere else. They call them stockpiles, for example. So in any case, there are, there are ways of, um, of approaching these problems. Only that, um, admittedly, there are companies who choose the simpler way, cheaper way, but uh, at the end, more environmentally destructive way. So I'd like to uh, interject at this point something that I've been thinking about a long time, not just for mining, but other major industries in our country. So um, the investment or the cost, the capital uh, cost of equipment, is uh, it's all borne out by the contractor. The um, you know the return on investment or the profit margin. Now, I've heard or I know for a fact that many of the products from the mining industry are of a medium um, quality. What I mean is the, um, the mining products are not pure. They are of a semi-crude nature. And in fact, these are being exported to other countries. And then uh, the purification, the extraction to the high value uh, mineral products are done abroad. And the um, irony of it is these are re-imported back to our country. So now getting higher value products from our mining industry would require more highly technical capabilities in our country, expertise, producing our own high value metals, minerals, alloys would necessarily increase our capital outlay or our investment, but it would also increase the profit margin or the return on investment. Um, if only we would also invest in the technologies required to produce those high value products. So Mario, what is NIGS doing about this situation? Because um, Perry suggests the more environment friendly backhoe, very expensive compared to the bulldozer, okay? So if your products were to fetch a higher price in the market, then that expensive capital investment would be okay. Yeah, uh, the, the picture is like this. Uh, not for all, all minerals, uh, we send them as ores. Well, there's a difference between the pure mineral and what we call the ore. The ore is the piece of rock that contains some bits of minerals inside. So we call that the ore. Now, uh, f with the exception of gold, because in, in the Philippines, we process the gold until its purest, um, it purest existence, like in gold bars, for example. So we produce gold bars. But the other uh, minerals, like for copper, uh, nickel, uh, basically those are the two big mineral industries right now in the, in the country. 
indeed, yes, uh, what's happening is that the mining companies here, they extract the ore, and then they ore, the nic ore of copper or nickel, and then they send it abroad for processing. Uh, the term is processing. The ideal scenario, however, is that we should have our own processing plants. But the main hindrance in, um, in uh, putting up our own min uh, mineral processing plants is the cost of electricity. Cost of electricity, which is, I think, uh, the highest in Southeast Asia, if not in Asia. So there's, again, an economics behind uh, why we are not able to process our own minerals. Technolo um, capability wise, uh, we are capable, we, we have trained personnel, but then again, it all goes into the business of it, the economics of it, yes. Uh, that also, that's also true for what used to be the um, steel industry in the Philippines. Uh, during the 1970s, there was a steel industry in the Philippines that's based in Iligan. Uh, the plant, the infrastructure still exists there. There are plans to, to uh, revitalize that plant, but uh, it has not been, uh, it's not, it has not been flying yet, but they're, they're also hopeful uh, given now the better, um, better um, ratio of um, uh, cost benefit as far as um, materials are concerned and the technology is concerned also. So ideally, yes, we should be processing our own so that uh, we are adding value to our resources, but um, somehow uh, there's a hump that is being introduced by the more expensive uh, power rates in the country. Yeah. Basically, that's the reason. If I may. Of course. Uh, um. Again, going back to the ROI, you know, uh, I think the mining companies are faced with a situation with maintaining the current ROI, which will eventually become zero, or reducing their ROI, but sustaining it for the long term. Because if, if they worry about their, to maintain their ROI now, I'm sure they're going to be closed down. They cannot continue as is. So they should be willing, as I've said, uh, changing mindsets, no? that uh, uh, willing to take in reduced ROI, but ensuring that their operations will continue over the long term. I think it's a no-brainer. No? So uh, ROI of uh, six versus ROI of zero. So I think the decision is easy to make. Yeah, and also uh, we have to put things in context again. The business of mining does not happen overnight, of course. Um, the gestation period from, okay, there are basically four parts in the mining cycle. Um, it's uh, first is prospecting and exploration. Then you have the um, development uh, period, then the mining phase, and then uh, rehabilitation, which Perry says should start from day one, which I agree also. Uh, there are, you, you can put in rehabilitation procedures starting from day one. So of the four stages, the gestation period from the first to the, let's say, let's not go yet to the final rehab, uh, to the um, end of the mining when the ore is, uh, is all taken up, extracted, would range between 10 to 100 years. I can give you an example. Felix Mining has been mining their Santo Tomas II deposit. It's a copper gold deposit for the last 60 years, I guess. They started in the 1950s. It's still operating until now. So, uh, but they started way back for the exploration period, at least 20 years before, maybe 10 years before. So it's a very long engagement by a contractor who does not own the minerals, by the way. The Regalian doctrine in the mining industry is that anything below ground under, underneath the earth is, belongs to the state, but the state is not capable, it's not always capable of uh, extracting it. So the government gets into contract with uh, a second party, and that is the contractor, who will spend all, um, will risk all its um, financial capabilities to do the procedure. Of course, the government will be the regulator. It provides the permits, it controls its monitors, and. Um, all these regulations, it comes from the government. Yeah. So it's a big investment. It's a, it's a high stake endeavor. Um, it's a very risky business. So, so many things to talk about, but I'd like to pick up um, Felix. You said it's been around for 60 years. Would you say that it's sustainable and responsible mining on the part of Felix? Are there other examples? And then, um, I also wanted to ask about a steel because I know that a new company, Steel Asia, claims to be providing half 
the supply of steel for the construction industry, and that's based in Mindanao. My third question is about the nickel uh, ores, and we know that price of nickel is relatively down. At the moment, yes, Yet but still, we're, um, still manageable. Yes. We're aware that um, some of our mining companies with foreign partners are mining nickel for the very, ve very valuable transition metals that are found in the nickel that could be extracted by them. So there are those three questions, but I have like the same number of questions for Barry. Okay, so quickly. Um, I'll try Mario. to be brief, yes. yes. Uh, let's start with the case of Felix. Well, uh, it is not only Felix that has been um, in existence for quite a while now, but uh, perhaps one, so one of the reasons why uh, Felix is still existing. I'm speaking of that particular deposit, Santo Tomas, that's in Padcal, uh, just south of Baguio City. Is that, uh, well, because it's the geological setting is also very, very promising. Uh, the grades are good, the uh, volume is quite large, but also the company has practiced responsible mining in the last 50, 60 years. And then the second thing is that. Uh, uh, if if um, if uh, the image of mining to most people is uh, simply extracting dirt on the surface of the earth, the method they use in that particular mine is underground mining. So you don't basically visibly see what's happening at the surface. It's as if nothing is going underneath, but it's underground mining. So again, it's perspective of, of uh, uh, a normal person uh, it's a matter of perspective, normal person seeing directly what's happening on the surface. But in this particular case, it's underground mining. Of course, the technology is quite um, more difficult, more expensive, even, even more risky, actually. But um, environmentally wise, uh, it's not seen at the surface as being the extraction of materials from the ground. And perhaps the third is that it has been very, that company has been very socially responsible um, in, in the Mining Act, there's such a thing as the SDMP, that's a Social Development Management uh, Program, which uh, sets aside a big chunk of your mining uh, budget that is meant um, exclusively in the development of the um, social environment, uh, the cities, municipalities, or barangays around. And perhaps that's also the third reason why this company has stayed there, because it's been very responsible in taking care of its uh, SDMP program. Uh, for the case of, um, let me go first to the nickel uh, issue. Uh, there's also a particular company, which is always being mentioned in several fora or forums, Rio Tuba in southern Palawan. That uh, nickel mine has also been existent for uh, quite some time now. And it's also a good example where rehabilitation has been successful. Of course, um, as I mentioned at the start, uh, different ores, different uh, minerals have their different characteristics and therefore different methodologies, methodologies are viable. In the case of nickel, nickel exists at very shallow depths in the surface so that the viable option only to mine it is by, it's not even open pit, we don't consider it as open pit, it's scraping just scraping the ground. So, but the, the very drastic effect of that is that you cut trees, basically. But then it's not impossible to replant trees. So that's what has happened in Rio Tuba. They're continuing to do that. And it has uh, proven, been proven that it is viable and it's uh, sustainable. As far as the iron industry is concerned, I'm not so familiar with that. But as I said, there are attempts now to revive the industry. But then again, it's the power rates, which is, um, you know, it's killing it, basically, yes. I also heard it's not only the power rates, it's also the smuggling rates, okay? So you are producing steel, but you have second grade steel uh, from other countries being smuggled to the country. So I was told that if you only try to control that smuggling, then these local steel industries will start to flourish. 
I want to ask yeah. Barry about yeah. the other factors. Yeah. Anyway, okay. yes. I would like to add, no, yung still Asia. Uh, do you realize that we don't produce a single nail in the country? It's even the needle that we use, it's important. We don't produce anything. What what still Asia produce are rolled sheets. No? Right. So the, the the needle, the nail, the paco, the tornillo, they're all important. We don't produce it. But even if even when we had the steel industry. But that's a good start and yes. that's already brought down uh, the price of steel and it's really uh, why we partly why we also have the booming construction industry. That's why we need to have we our need. Own steel industry. Yes. But uh, as Mario said, the, the electricity and the smuggling have to be prepared. So we have anyway, the iron ore. Go, going back to what Mar, uh, Mario was uh, discussing about Rio Tuba, well, <coughs> yes, uh, Rio Tuba had did some reforestation, but this is where the point I made no? in, in that area. If they, they could have only, done better. If, 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 if they had uh, uh, backhoe the trees, put it somewhere, they could use it to replace it now. What they did is, yes, they did replanting, but they replanted with exotic species. So w with what I was thinking is if you use the backhoe, you could have returned what was removed. The same trees. Yes, the same trees. Ideally, almost, you could restore it to as close as possible. We know it, it couldn't be restored to its original state, but it would be restored to as close as possible. So, so yes, it could have been done better if they had a different set of uh, it all boils down to the cost. Yeah, yeah. I, I know, I know. That, that's why, but, the, but then, in the end, if you're shut down, then there's no arrow height to speak of. So, uh, in, in some areas, um, the, the conflict between biodiversity and uh, mining stems from the fact that biodiversity as a legal uh, concept came only into the picture in 1992 during the Earth Summit. So it, before that, before that, mining was already in existence. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in an island uh, like Dinagat, okay, it had been declared a mining reserve in the 1930s. Can you please tell us a bit more about Dinagat Island, yes, the uh, unique uh, biodiversity? So Dinagat Island is uh, north of uh, Surigao, no? and uh, it is uh, an island where. Uh, a forest called ultramafic, forest ultramafic is found, meaning it's an area that is highly mineralized. And the trees, the plant materials that grew there are only specific to that condition. No? So, in, so this is where you can see bonsai forest or the pygmy forest, okay? So, but, but as I was saying, it had been declared a mining reserve since the 1930s. And there are now about 18 mining production sharing agreement in existence, some of which have been suspended by uh, the former uh, Secretary Gina Lopez. No? Uh, and again, I've been to that island at least twice, and if you look at the way they, they have been mining, no, it, it's really uh, scary because uh, we were up 800 meters in, in one of the areas, and you can see down below, almost sea level na ang nakukay nila. Okay? So, again, is there a better way? Maybe there is. But I think that the main challenge is because it has been done in the easier way, nobody has had put their heads to think about doing it a better way. They're, they're so used to doing it the business as usual model, they have never thought of doing it or thought about doing it some other. And I think this is the right time. No? Uh, the geologists, the mining engineers, the metallurgical engineers should come together and think about how do we make things better. No? So we all agree that mining should not be stopped at this stage. It needs to be improved. It needs to address the environmental issues. It needs to address the social issues. And everything can go on. No? So it, it's the change in mindsets on how do we do, do mining that needs to be Talk about. No? There are many things that nakagawian, no? nakagawian, na hindi na natin naisip na pwede palang ibang paraan. No? And, and ito yung magandang pagkakataon na pag-isipan natin, pagtulungan natin. No? Bilang isang pamantasan, ito yung pinakamagandang oportunidad, eh, pagkakataon, para pag-isipan natin ito, pagtulong-tulungan natin. No? It's important. Uh, per personally, ma'am, uh, I was, I, I'm now engaged in, in 
working with two non-metallic mine, mine, uh, mining groups. And the reason I got involved is that I was challenged by the former director uh, of NITS, no, Kaloy Aisilia. And he said, you know, you, you environmentalists, the problem with you environmentalists is that you keep on criticizing mining mm -hmm. as doing harm. Mm -hmm. Yet when we approach you to help us, to tell us how to do good, you won't work, it, work with us. So where do you put us, leave us in that situation? That's okay. why I, I have to took up that, take up the challenge okay. to work with these non-metallic -mine, non mining groups so to find ways to, to do better. I think the perspective should be ecological, one ecosystem, and also geological. But let's focus on, say, the top <laughs> five metals or uh, mineral ores. You talked about gold, copper, iron, okay. nickel. So Lumen. you say Felix bauxite, bauxite is good mine. for um, that gold and gold copper. Gold. So, yung mga bundok doon, hindi naman naa-apektuhan kasi nag-uhukoy uh, uh, sila. Underground. Underground. So, wala namang geological ano doon, impact. Well, the, the, there, there's also an impact in the sense that um, when you excavate um, mm -hmm. a solid object, you actually lessen its strength. Yes. But again, this is where the mining engineers, the civil engineers come in. They design the structure in such a way that it can resist any eventual, for example, earthquake. That place is very close to uh, Baguio, and you remember Baguio City, what happened to it in 1990. The mine site had barely any scar from that earthquake. That means that it was very well designed. Now, I think the problem with the image of the mining industry as far as degradation is concerned is um, there's a big contribution from uh, the small-scale miners. Uh, well, it is in the law also that you can do mining at the small scale. May minahang bayan nga tayo. That's in the Mining Act also. But then, there are a lot of others, small scale miners, who do not care about the environment at all. They use, for example, mercury. They use cyanide, which are all prohibited by, by the law. Pero ito yung image na nakikita ng tao kasi. Um, and then, uh, yung mindset, again, is that when you see that, even siguro ako, kung hindi ako geologist or not well educated about the issue, uh, I, would, I would also have the same perspective. So that has to change also. But even within the, the big mines or the company um, operated mines, there's also to be, there should also be um, a way of policing their own ranks. Kailangan i, meron talagang mga pasaway. Na, na mining companies. Uh, there's no argument about that. And that has to uh, take place now. And in fact, it, if uh, there's one good thing that um, was um, may wake up call nung pinagsususpend lahat ni uh, Secretary Gina Lopez yung companies na yun because it was a wake up call that the industry has to police its own ranks. First pass talaga yung ginawa ni Gina. Mm -hmm. So out of 200, hindi po masayo yung mga one third. So it looks like uh, there was supposed to be an next set. An next set. Okay. Pero <laughs> Overtaken yun yung pinaka, by the uh, 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 Well, non compliant. So, for the interest of uh, our viewers, let us reiterate ano talaga yung value ng mining industry? Ano ba yung benefits to society ng gold, copper, uh, aluminum, nickel, iron? Summarize lang ulit, uh, ano, Mario, kasi alam ko very basic yan, pero sa ating daily lives, talagang napaka-importante niyang mga ano na yan. Yeah, well, yung sinimulan natin na uh, parang premise is civilizations need the uh, mining, especially kung developing pa lang tong civilization na to. For the Western world, they also started as mining countries, actually. So, there's really uh, a need for for extracting these minerals, uh, actually, ang motto ng miners is if, if it cannot be grown, it has to be mined. Yeah. Uh, and so, the um, industry, there, well, let's put uh, again them in their proper uh, context. For example, cement. You need cement to construct this building. So there's no way you can construct this building without mining the raw materials for cement. And that's for open pit mines, actually. 
uh, because these are limestone areas, the um, uh, mineral sector that was mentioned by Perry, which is non-metallic. Gold obviously has its own uh, purposes, but uh, even for technology, your cell phones have gold in it, uh, and all the computer software, there's gold in them. Uh, for copper, obviously, all the lights here would not be here without the copper wires. And yeah, the only perhaps um, the emphasis of what should be the emphasis right now is because these are, we can call this the traditional metals, yes. the copper, gold, um, uh, nickel, um, even iron and uh, silver, which usually goes with gold. I think the focus should now also be as far as the academic uh, sector is concerned is to look into the minerals that will be used in the future. And in fact, Kaloya Arcilia has a project with the OST looking at the content of nickel laterites as far as scandium is concerned, yes. which is much more expensive than gold, which has applications in uh, high, technology, um, high technology, such as uh, space technology. And there are others, actually, cobalt um, and the rare other rare earth uh, elements. And um, fortunately, um, the DOST has been also supportive in uh, granting, although um, still minimal, I would say, um, research grants for this purpose. Um, the government should provide more um, support as far as uh, doing these uh, kinds of research are concerned. Mm. So I think uh, IT and nanotechnologies mm. make uh, important use have many Medicine. medicines uh, from our uh, transition earth metals. Mm. And uh, so it's important to support the mining industry, but uh, they should be uh, responsible and they must come up with um, long-term sustainability. Uh, Change the way they do business. Yeah, yeah, programs. So I'd like to um, uh, maybe ask uh, Perry for some final words, uh, words of advice. You told me in, in the past that um, in uh, Dinagat Island, Nickel is being uh, mined, Nickel and, and then uh, it's got valuable um, uh, metals I think that's, like that's what, uh, chromium. Is it chromium? Scandium. Scandium. So basically, uh, I think the greatest, uh, the largest producer of scandium now is China, but they don't have scandium mm. in the land, so they okay. take it from the nickel ores that we export to them. Yeah, that's the other concern because the mining company sells only the nickel, nickel. content. Yes. And the scandium is free. Yeah. yeah. But it earn. is, in fact, uh, if you do the math, it's even more. Um, they earn more from the scandium. The, exactly. the buyer. Um, exactly. So yeah. I think that um, NIGS should take the lead in uh, trying to uh, learn uh, this scandium extraction technology. And then perhaps, um, you know, we would get a better return on investment on our uh, mining activities from the nickel. I, think, yeah, we, I heard that in, in, in the mining forum two weeks ago, YouTube was uh, setting up a plan to extract scandium. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> my, my last word, man, last is word. that uh, I think biodiversity and mining could coexist. It's just that uh, you have to change the mindsets on how we do business, on how we operate the mines, it, it would be difficult at the start because nobody has done it before. But if we as a university don't even think about it, how can it even happen? So I think that's our role as a, an academic institution to is explore ways on how the mining, the geologists, the mining engineers, the meteorological engineers, the, bi the biologists, the physicists, the chemists to work together you know, and come up with solutions that will uh, ensure that we, we get the benefits of the mining reduce its impact on the environment and make everybody happy. So uh, Perry has um, been uh, focusing uh, more on land-based mining, but he has a view on watersheds. And I know that Mario also has um, some view on new sites of mining. So Mario, perhaps you can tell us about the future of mining in the Philippines, assuming that we're able to fix up the way we do the uh, land-based mining, the forest-based mining. Uh, you mean 
non-land based mining non-land based okay, mining non-land based yes. mining Okay, there's a new frontier in mining. I say new frontier because it's relatively new. It started only in 1996 when a United Nations organization, organization called the International Seabed Authority was established. The ISA, for short, uh, was established to, um, um, to, to carry out the, or to implement Part six of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And what is part six? Part six is the area beyond national jurisdiction. So we are in international seas, but underneath the oceans, there's a seabed. And in the seabed, there are minerals, which are untouched. But they are also very um, fragile, and, but they contain also high technology minerals. And therefore, at the moment, um, this uh, UN organization is the regulator for uh, exploration activities in the seabed. We can perhaps uh, set up uh, another forum for this, but uh, yes, that's a new frontier, and the Philippines can, can engage in this kind of um, mineral exploration activities, but as a state party to UNCLOS. Only state parties can participate in, the, uh, in seabed mineral uh, mining activities as regulated by the ISA. So it's nice to end on that note, Mario. Uh, we're thinking of um, future exploration. And um, I'd like to thank you and Perry for uh, uh, gracing uh, uh, this occasion. And let's just say that from the University of the Philippines, we know what needs to be done on the basic level. It's to increase the number of technical experts uh, in geology and in the related disciplines. But I think it's also important <coughs> to have that bigger long-term um, view of what's good for a particular society in the mining uh, area. And so uh, Perry talked about the impact of mining on biodiversity and the biostratum. And we already know that the mining companies are being required to take care of the employees. So it's about social engagement in the long term or corporate social responsibility, which our university as the national university emphasizes in any major industry or undertaking uh, in the country. So thank you very much for being with us in this science innovation uh, talk on responsible, sustainable mining. Maraming maraming salamat po.